Hello and welcome to the brand new chapter of Outlook Money's webinar series. This series is a part of the Investor Education and Awareness Initiative of Aditya Birla Sun Life Mutual Fund in association with Outlook Money. Diwali is an auspicious occasion when people traditionally open their homes and hearts to make new beginnings. Diwali is also the time when Indian households start thinking of wealth and asset allocation. Whether it's buying a new house or a car or making new investments, this is the time when people like to make their big purchases and create wealth for themselves and their families. I'm Nidhi Sinha, editor Outlook Money, and today I have with me industry veterans to discuss how to create wealth and how to sync the whole exercise with our financial goals and our risk appetite. First, I would like to welcome Mr. K.S. Rao, who's the head of investor education and distribution development at Aditya Birla Sun Life AMC. Mr. Rao's mission is to take financial literacy and investor education to various demographic segments across geographies to inculcate savings habits. He has spent about two decades in the mutual funds industry and is an alumni of IM Calcutta. Welcome, Mr. Rao. Thank you so much, Nidhi Sinan. Good morning to all. We also have with us Mr. Ramit Trivedi, who is an author, speaker, blogger and trainer with over 26 years of experience in the capital markets. He's authored several books, including Riding the Roller Coaster. The third expert joining us today is Mr. Suresh Sadagopal, who's a SEBI registered investment advisor, certified financial planner, and founder of Ladder 7 Financial Advisories. He founded the Financial Planners Guild in 2010 in India, and was also a founding member of the Association of Registered Investment Advisors. So let's get started with today's discussion. My first question is to Mr. Rao. Mr. Rao, Diwali is that auspicious occasion when most Indians, Indians traditionally worship the goddess of wealth, Lakshmi. How do you define wealth creation? Thank you so much, Janidiji, and uh, good morning to all. I wish you all very happy Diwali. Uh, indeed, it's an honor to be here on this occasion with the uh, alighted panel, and it's glad. And incidentally, today it's a wealth creation. We are talking about the wealth is uh, Nidhi, right? It's a creation. It's a, <laughs> the, it's, it's a fabulous to have uh, Nidhi ji to start this session. And, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. And Diwali is one festival uh, which is uh, we always dedicated to the goddess Lakshmi and. Uh, the spiritual, uh, spiritual aspect of Diwali is it is a victory of uh, like you know light over the darkness or the knowledge over the ignorance, and the true wealth we create is uh, uh, when we get out of that and have that enough patience mm -hmm. where we intend to get there. What the wealth we would like to create? That's where uh, we pray to Goddess Lakshmi, and uh, it is a wealth and richness. Uh, like you know, this is what the, we we club together. Sometimes wealth doesn't mean that it's only money. That's it's a beyond money. It's a, and uh, it's like you know building various uh, other uh, holistic way of looking at. Uh, it could be your health. Uh, it's it, it could be your spiritual wealth. It could be your family. It could be your social. And and uh, and last but not the least, Diwali is a festival. We don't celebrate alone at home. We celebrate with the community, family, and all. In you know, the wealth is here not only for you to enjoy, but is also to distribute. Probably it got a significance that you create wealth and you enjoy wealth and you also distribute, give your wealth. I mean, this is where uh, I look at it. The charity also comes there and uh, we do need to save for the charity as we go forward. And when it comes to the wealth creation, I personally feel it is like being wealthy is much more easier. They say, Amir banna kafi asan hai. But Amir bane rehna kafi mushkil. And for that, we need like, you know, people like Suresh ji to help us that seven ladders uh, where we can step up. Uh, and, you know, one is uh, uh, saving rightly, investing appropriately and stepping up our investment. And remaining wealthy is equally important. I mean, it's uh, like uh, it's, it's always it's a wealth protection. It's, it's, it's about uh, how I can protect the purchasing power of my wealth. Today, I may have a crore of rupees, but that is not having the equal value after five years. Then I need to protect it. I mean, that's the first part of it. Second, protection alone is not sufficient. I need to enhance it so that I can meet my all the expenses. You know, I need to invest it rightly. And of course, today we have uh, with us Amit uh, about the markets and the roller coaster ride is book, uh, which always briefs as uh, uh, you know, how you need to enjoy the ride. Of course, you need to protect it as you enjoy it. And last but not the least, uh, the rise in the purchasing power 
I mean, can I get my wealth meeting all my investment requirements, all my future requirements available to me? That is the true wealth for us. Otherwise, uh, uh, and, I mean, uh, just to sum it up, wealth creation is one, your structured way of investing and staying invested and uh, and making that wealth working for you. And last but not the least, as I said, uh, philanthropy, which I always tell people, all of us who, one, who can afford to give it to someone, that is the time where we need to look at that way. That is a broad wealth creation. And it goes well with a Diwali because uh, you not only light the lamp, but you also spread, uh, give it to someone, you celebrate with the sweets. That's where you create your wealth to someone to give it to someone. Absolutely, Mr. Rao. Philanthropy is, in fact, a big part of, uh, you know, Diwali, the way people conduct uh, Diwali. It is a big part of, you know, wealth creation and also giving, uh, uh, you know, at the same time. Those are two uh, parts of the traditional uh, coin that we have, so to say. So let me come to Mr. Trivedi now. Uh, so people usually look at creating wealth to, you know, fulfill the needs of their families. But is there more to the process? Of course, Mr. Rao has listed several other things that, that is uh, there, but uh, I wanted your opinion also. Well, Rao sir started uh, beautifully by uh, highlighting the importance of wealth in various ways. And that's where I, it, it reminded me of an old uh, uh, joke uh, which said that the guy was so poor that all he had was money. A lot of times people make the mistake of defining wealth only in terms of money, but the true wealthy is somebody who has everything that money can't buy. And that's really the wealth. Now, uh, if, if that's the case, uh, does it mean that money is not important? No, not really. Money is essential because in order to reach that stage and stay at that stage also, you need to take care of your basic requirements. And what are those basic requirements? So if you look at the, uh, you know, uh, basic needs of any family, roti kapda makan. Now, for this, we need money. If you go uh, beyond that, then a lot of luxuries also, we need money. So essentially, what are these basic needs and luxuries for? These basic needs and luxuries are required to live the life of one's choice. If I'm able to live the life of my choice, and if I have enough money to fund that, without depending on somebody else, then I'm wealthy. And that, according to me, is the definition of wealth. And if that's, that's how I define wealth, then the first thing is I have to define that life which I want to live. And that's where the first step in the process is to identify my targets, my luxury, my goals. And incidentally, the goddess Lakshmi, Lakshmi and Lakshya both seem to have the same root. So if I decide the target and then I plan to have the wealth, uh, create the wealth. So that's first step. Once I've done that, then I need to take care of a lot of potential uncertainties on the path of wealth creation. And once uh, those things are taken care of, it's like when I start a long journey, uh, I may have the best of the cars, the fastest of the cars, but I need a seat belt. I need the brakes in the car. So those things are required in order to ensure that I don't meet with those accidents or even if there is an accident, the impact on me is the least. Yeah, so these are some of the basic steps to uh, create wealth. And for that, there is a process, define your goals, uh, uh, take care of the short-term contingencies or the risks, and then plan your investments that help you step-by-step step reach closer to your wealth creation goal. Right, Mr. Trivedi, that as you aptly put it, there is a relation between Lakshmi and Lakshya and those have to be in sync. So that brings me to Mr. Sada Gopal. And uh, so what is the path to wealth creation or is there really one? And, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about wealth creation and financial planning, are they one and the same thing or are there subtle differences? Uh, so let me answer the question number one. What is the path to wealth creation? Uh, see, actually, wealth creation is, uh, I mean, that is, the, uh, that is the broad thing we talk about. And uh, most of uh, the people actually think that wealth creation, uh, for wealth creation, you have to invest in product which gives amazing uh, return or double digit return. But actually, uh, I mean, that is actually far from the truth. So ultimately, we have goals, we need to meet our goals. 
we need to meet our uh, current expenses and over a period of time we need to create enough wealth for our uh, retirement uh, phase and uh, for uh, uh, and for the uh, i mean future i mean the future means we may want to do philanthropy like mr rao was mentioning uh, now and uh, in the years ahead and at the same time we also may want to pass a legacy so the wealth creation objective is an ongoing objective it is not like i have a, a say target like 1 crore or 2 crores or something like that so and what is the path towards wealth creation the path is actually very very simple so one of the one of the thing that we need to do in terms of wealth creation is uh, to be financially i mean that way as a person and financially we need to be well grounded we need to be uh, disciplined we need to be uh, uh, we need to uh, con- control the things which we can control like our expenses and i mean we need, we need to give a thought on our goals so these are the controllables uh, a lot of times we uh, tend to think about the stock market the economy and a lot of other things which we don't have any control over so the point is we have to have a uh, i mean we have to very very clearly have our hand on the things that we can control and then we can, we have to move ahead so the second thing is our wealth creation and financial planning one and the same thing actually these are related they are not one and the same thing as far as financial planning is concerned it is something that we do for a, a person or a family to achieve all the things that they want to achieve maybe the goals or maybe some objectives targets in the time frames that they want so as long as we agree that these things are achievable goals and as long as uh, we are uh, interested in meeting those goals so then we have to put a plan together a financial architecture together to meet those goals now basically because of financial planning we do wealth creation not the other way around and uh, financial planning is very very important irrespective of whether a person is wealthy not wealthy whichever way in in fact if the person is not really that very wealthy financial uh, i mean uh, financial planning is even more required because the margin for error is that much less so i mean it is not really uh, different but uh, one will lead to the other uh, financial proper financial planning will uh, lead to appropriate wealth creation for a person right mr sadagopan i completely agree with that and uh, you know wealth creation and financial planning definitely go hand in hand but i would just you know take that question a little further and put it to mr rao uh, that you know once uh, suppose you have a set of financial goals and you are uh, you know you've saved enough to kind of uh, or you have a plan in place where you know that they are achievable and still uh, do you think there is a further scope of wealth creation can you go forward on that path and how do you do that thank you so much nidhi ji for this question and uh, i will go back uh, where uh, um, mr suresh ji was talking about uh, on the financial plan i mean it's like you know today we are talking about path to prosperity and uh, this path is something you know financial planning will giving that path and prosperity could be the uh, the end goal of your wealth creation and it's like you know to put it uh, i have financial goals and i have plan to reach those goals then how i can once i plan it alone is not sufficient then i am investing according to that which fits to the plan and this is where we can reach to the goal when you know i used to tell in my own uh, style of acronyms uh, the governing rules of wealth creation is nothing but a 4g uh, the 4g network kind of you know which what we use the first g is you get your money uh, that is you earn and that money what you are getting you need to grow your money this is where your plan and investments are happening. and uh, not growing alone is not sufficient you need to guard your money one is to protect against the inflation and protect for yourself with the insurance kind of thing that's a third g and the fourth g is uh, as i earlier said you need to give back this money it's like uh, none of us can carry back either i need to give to the children or the church or to the mosque or to the society you need to give back this money how these four g's can like in this path it is like uh, Uh, when i take my travel now the uh, i put my gps uh, this is a prosperity i need to reach this is my samriddhi where i need to reach and um, in the processes when i travel uh, the travel is not always the same and my gps reroutes to me there is a market correction or there could be a change there could be a pandemic which is coming in then i need to either delay my travel or i need to reroute and so that i can accelerate my plan then what is those things to, to look at i look at few steps where we can look at the first is uh, as uh, suresh ji said rightly i mean set those right goals i mean you know we most of the times we set the goals but are they are right 
and then are you investing the money according to your goals i mean you know most of the times we invest, invest at a hack and uh, last few year i i remember last year when we were doing with outlook money uh, the bsc sensex was somewhere at 43000 dollars and that is the time we have seen one question from the participant uh, it is at the all time high what shall we do and you know and none of us can say now you know you reach to 60 and of course i mean you know we are trading around 60 then uh, then how you need to look uh, how you need to invest and invest it rightly for your goals and at this point of the time diversifying your portfolio i remember amit ji was asked uh, answered one question at that point of the time that is the time gold was in a little preferred asset class and later correction started coming and people are asking how do i invest my money uh, into the gold and we were doing danteras uh, i mean incidentally now again danteras and today i can invest in the gold and that is where you need to invest uh, the right asset allocation is the right and also i have seen people uh, these are the financial goals we talk about mutual funds and investment but i have seen people who create a real wealth even those who are leveraging right and taking the right loans for the right purpose for that your credit scores are important you know that's one more step you ensure you properly maintain your credit score and the last but not the least i always say is equity is one asset class irrespective it is risky but that asset class you can't ignore to create your wealth and how you allocate to the equity I mean, you know, uh, don't go into the biases and uh, how you can stay invested. That's where it comes the professional approach, like, uh, you know, reaching out to people like Suresh said, Gopan, and uh, that's where uh, you get somebody who is supporting you and uh, who have a sounding board for you so that you will, cre you have created a wealth, but that wealth is going to need to last long. That's where the professional help play a vital role. That's where you can manage your wealth. And last but not the least, uh, learn to manage the wealth. That's where you can read out with money. <laughs> Thank you so much for that and absolutely right, Mr. Rao. And actually, uh, while we, we you were talking about equity, that uh, you know makes it very pertinent to ask that, uh, does the risk appetite play a role even at this level when it comes to wealth creation uh, beyond financial goals? I understand that you know some of the risk appetite has to be you know tied in with the financial goals, but even when it comes to overall wealth creation, so, uh, Mr. Trivedi, how does risk appetite play a role at that level and how important is insurance for wealth creation? Wonderful. That's a brilliant question. And let me break the risk into two parts, uh, the way uh, a typical textbook would define. Uh, one uh, risk is what is called the pure risk, where the uh, probability, probability is either a negative outcome or uh, as it is, I mean, status quo. So, for example, uh, if I built a house, then the status quo is the uh, house uh, remains as it is and I continue to use it. But the negative outcome is when there's a fire in the house, there's a theft in the house, so that's a negative outcome. But there's no profit coming from that, living in that house as such. Whereas financial assets are where you get three outcomes. One is a loss is possible, a status quo is possible, and a profit is also possible. So I'll break the two in, uh, you know, separately, the, the risk in two parts. And the uh, first pure risk is where uh, insurance products are available. So uh, there are insurance products against, let's say, uh, damage to house property, for example, or if there is a health uh, uh, condition uh, and then somebody uh, is hospitalized or falls sick or uh, meets with some, uh, uh, you know, certain types of illnesses like uh, uh, kidney failure or something of that sort, then there are insurance products available to financially protect the individual or the family. Uh, when a life is lost, then again, uh, especially the earning member's life results into financial loss to the family. So in such case, again, life insurance is available. So these are the uh, you know uh, insurance products which help a family get up when there is a uh, calamity or an unfortunate event. Now that is like your uh, seat belt in the car or that's like your airbag in the car, more like an airbag rather than a seat belt. So when there is a crash, the airbags uh, uh, you know, uh, come to help and protect one from getting uh, severely injured. So that's the kind of uh, the thing that is required. So all the financial assets on the other end, which have the potential to provide uh, you the upside or the profits are the accelerator in the car. And these are the like, uh, you know, the seat belts and airbags and uh, those safety beams and stuff like that. So those are, those are for protection and you need both. In the absence of one, the second is useless. I mean, you 
go fast without airbags and without seat belts and without brakes and you will meet up a death faster and that's not the purpose of the journey the journey is to stay alive yeah. so financially alive in the context of this so that's the purpose of uh, insurance then comes the risk uh, which is the investment related risk which is uh, where profit is also possible now there one needs to take a call because though a lot of people come and ask in various public four hour meetings give me something that is safe but i want high returns now that's i mean it, it's like uh, finding a yeti in the himalayas i mean you don't, uh, hear about him but you don't find one so these are fiction uh, if it is safe don't expect high profits if you are expecting profits it is not 100% safe so the equation is that simple having said that even when something is absolutely safe there also one runs the risk of losing the purchasing power because the inflation beats the return of that safe product so eventually you got a risk the sum and the substance of all these things is there is nothing called risk free and if there is nothing called risk free all you need to do is to choose which risks to take and how much to take that's where understanding one's risk appetite becomes critical and that process helps in choosing what kind of risks that one needs to take and how much so how do you come to that risk appetite question ask three questions number 1 do you need to take risk the need to take risk is arises when in order to meet your goals you need to earn more than inflation that's your need to take risk do you have the ability to take risk the financial ability which means if you got more resources than uh, you need then your ability goes up if your resources are limited then your uh, ability goes down or your time horizon is long your ability goes up if you, you, your goal is very short then your ability goes down so stuff like that and third is your willingness to take risk are you willing to take risk so yesterday i was talking to an investor just uh, an informal chat uh, uh, somebody uh, known and uh, this person said uh, you know while uh, my husband uh, takes care of my investments and puts money in stocks and mutual funds uh, whatever little control i have i only buy fixed deposits and then this person was getting defensive i said there is no point in getting defensive eventually after investing your money if you lose the sleep at night then that investment is not useful and that's where the willingness question comes in are you willing to handle that risk or not so ask these three questions need ability and willingness and you broadly get an idea of your risk appetite and then align your portfolio in line with that so that's that's the way uh, you you manage so insurance and understanding one's risk profile both play a vital role in the path to wealth creation that was very well put uh, mr trivedi and actually uh, while we are talking about risk and protection and all that i would like to ask mr sada gopan that uh, you know sometimes people tend to take risks that you know that may not be in sync with their appetite so how does financial indiscip uh, indiscipline you know uh, in a way financial indiscipline creeps in sometimes um, uh, so what can one do to understand uh, you know what Uh, products are right for them uh, what products are not right uh, for them and what are the ways at, to deal with it and identify one's uh, risk profile so to say financial products or how much wealth one needs to create cannot be uh, seen in isolation so we will have to look at the person's uh, situation we will have to look at what is that family looking forward to in terms of uh, goals and achievement of the goals when the goals are coming up like amit was also talking about when the goals are coming up uh, i mean uh, in the near future then accordingly we will have to keep probably in the non risky assets because the money is uh, the goal is important and we need the money for the goal so it has to be in a non risky asset which can be tapped in for uh, meeting that particular goal so i mean it is all contextual so um, how much risk we can take is a is a matter of uh, uh, what is called the risk profile uh amit was uh, talking about that uh, thing before so the risk profile is uh, as a person as far as uh, investments are concerned how much risk are you willing to stomach 
so that is one thing the financial risk capacity is the next thing suppose you have a long long tenure uh, to retire so i am not talking about the biological age because a lot of people want to retire at 42 and 45 so it is not the biological age which i am talking about so if uh, you have say 15 years to retire if you have 25 years to retire then uh, potentially your risk capacity is uh, much higher or if the wealth uh, accumulation uh, for one person is actually uh, very high then the risk capacity is high if both the spouses are working the potentially the risk capacity is high so we will have to look at what is that one needs to do in their particular context we cannot really look at what my colleagues are doing what my brother or sister are doing or anybody else is doing and uh, uh, maybe replicate that in my portfolio so we need to understand what are our goals when is it coming up and according to that what is uh, what is an appropriate instrument to meet that goal see because we have to understand that all the investments that we are uh, making see the investment per se is not important meeting the goals is what is uh, important so we have to understand that context so getting a very high return so this is the fallacy getting very high return is not everything i'll give an example for that a lot of people have had invested sometimes some years back in a property because at one point in time property was doing well thinking that that will come in handy for their children's uh, education okay i actually had a case about say 3 to 4 years back that gentleman uh, from the north area had uh, called up delhi region had called up and he said i have so many properties but i am i'm uh, not able to liquidate any of them and i want to uh, i mean take a loan so in that context he was actually talking to me as a financial advisor so i mean this kind of a thing is the typical mismatch which happens when people do not understand what is that they require in their situation and they go after returns uh, in to the exclusion of everything else so i mean returns uh, returns are important but we will have to look at the goals and the kind of risk we are taking and we will have to be uh, fine with the investment returns that we are uh, dealing with so the first thing that we have to do is define the goals uh what are the uh, when are they coming up what is the what is the amount that i want to reach as far as the goal is concerned then in the context of that what is the risk uh, i can take and in the context of that what are the investments that i need to do so this is how we will have to go uh, with that not jump into say gold when it is actually going up or not jump into let us say an asset like crypto when it is going up thinking that that is the way to uh, create wealth or that is the way to ensure that all the goals are met right mr sadagopal and uh, actually what we see is one of the safest instruments through which one can uh, invest uh, safest in the sense of you know it's regulated and uh, you know there is proper research behind uh, mutual funds so i would like to ask mr rao that how can mutual funds effectively create wealth and what role does an emergency fund play uh, while uh, you know dealing with mutual funds also thanks nidhi for uh, this question you know always uh, mutual funds i always say mutual funds are your mutual friends to accomplish wherever you want to go because these are the this is a trusted vehicle how you choose it and the uh, earlier question when you asked suresh ji on the financial indiscipline and you know this when i invest with the mutual funds if i can structure it if i can automate it my indiscipline will never come in it's a disciplined way i start investing that's where you know uh, that 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 can create a lot of wealth for me because i am automating my savings and this is a, a simple tool of sip which is of the mutual funds any one of us who can put it i mean that's where i i can see i mean you know a few lakhs of people or crores of people who are looking at sip is the way they created a wealth over a period that that's clear issues but the right way i look at is uh, once you have your financial planner and once you have done your goals have a separate portfolio for each of these goals so that you will not deviate from you are creating the wealth you are not having you no know, you are not damaging yourself and when it comes to emergency fund the question which you are putting it is emergency fund like you know earlier amit ji was talking about the accelerator and brake and emergency fund i always look at like a spare wheel you does you don't need to use it but you need to have it so that you in the breakdown you have this it could be last pandemic we have seen many of uh, people who lost their jobs or there is a, a cut in salaries and there are no income. that is the time this money which is available to you so that you are not breaking your long term goals and long term investments and you are using this emergency the spare wheel at that point of the time but the once that job is done you take back the spare wheel and put it back 
so that your emergency fund you are recouping and your journey starts in like you know somebody has last six months of a job then six months he is using this money then he is getting back to that since emergency fund is serving a purpose which is uh, helping you not to disturb your other wealth creation goals which are happening if you are not having an emergency fund the typical case which we have seen uh, in the last 18 months for many of the people they have to redeem their long term money for example someone in the last year this august or the last august, last diwali period or before and somebody has disinvested because not having an emergency fund imagine they lost the opportunity of create a wealth uh, to the tune of 50 to 60% of uh, the corpus you know it's it's a, it's a substantial wealth you would have lost it and emergency is serving emergency fund is serving a purpose it may not be earning money to you on month on month it could be a 3% 4% never look at emergency fund what kind of return you are getting it but emergency fund how the what is serving you in the long run it is like you know it is helping you your wealth intact and your other goals are intact i personally feel all of us i mean you know uh, who are looking at any of the financial goals first create your emergency fund then start with others we do this uh, we go to the uh, army uh, jawans place you know fauji camps we do it and uh, and there is one thing i found uh, when i go when we do this program called fauji nivesh uh, most of our jawan boys you know it's a uh, uh, like uh, as they go to their hometowns at the time when they go to hometowns once in two years they have a habit of withdrawing their provident fund as a, there is a, there is a provision available to them that they can take a temporary loan uh, from the provident fund and they can invest they can take back I mean, and most of the times they withdraw this money and they will never come back uh, that money they have to give back at home and they will come in some of this is a provident fund we call it a bhavishya nidhi and they are taking out and uh, when we understood this we started telling them if you start even 2000 rupees sip in the liquid fund in a 24 months it's becoming 48000 rupees most of the times they have seen 36 to 40000 they take back home taking the loan from the provident fund and this has helped like you know most of them now they started their emergency fund into the liquid fund and today um, the places I, i i think you know i myself visited to 63 cantonments and uh, these places people started looking liquid fund as a tool and this is an emergency fund the provident fund remains as a provident fund it's a is a future requirement this is a small thing all of us can ensure and here comes the previous question of said open says financial indiscipline is dangerous have that financial discipline right mr rao so uh, mr trivedi i'll put the next question to you actually we were talking about um, equities last time also Uh, so there is a lot of buzz about equities right now uh, as mr rao said last year we were at 40000 now we have crossed 60000 and uh, you know we don't know whether this is going to stop as of now or um, so there's a lot of interest especially among youngsters among all age groups actually for uh, you know investing in direct equities but do you think that's the right tool or uh, it, it is it better to stick with mutual funds where you know there are professionals managing uh the research and everything so uh, nidhi you are absolutely right i mean uh, if you look at the number of new accounts being opened uh, uh, with the stock brokers or the uh, depositories uh, that trend has suddenly uh, gone up faster than the sensex or nifty's rise uh, and in that that uh, to an extent uh, looks good that uh, the financial assets are reaching more number of people but on the other hand it also is scary Uh, because uh, if the financial uh, investments are made without proper understanding there's an issue uh, so let me just uh, uh, you know uh, look at mutual funds versus uh, directly buying stocks you know again uh, using the journey analogy uh, that um, if i were to travel from let's say mumbai to delhi uh, i can take out my car and uh, self drive it myself and that would be a lot of fun because uh, i've got all the controls in my head i can decide when to start when to stop what speed to go which road to take i can take d2 i can increase the speed decrease the speed as per my will and there's so much flexibility so if i enjoy driving it it really works wonders in my favor however there are a few conditions that must be met condition number 1 i must know how to drive a car and that basic because without that i won't even get a license but i must know how to drive uh, knowing the theory of driving is not enough the uh, practical aspects of driving are equal, uh, uh, equally important so that's number one number two while i am driving my entire focus must be on the task of driving 
if i feel like reading the newspaper while driving one thing is guaranteed tomorrow's newspaper will feature my photograph with nice words from lot of friends so i have to focus on the task of driving which means i need to devote that time on driving number 3 one journey is fine but if i have to do uh, take up that journey let's say uh, once every month then i must also enjoy the task of driving i must also be okay if the car breaks down i have to get down and change the wheel if there is a puncture i have to uh, you know do whatever it takes so all those tasks associated affiliated tasks are also part of the job and i cannot complain that i don't want to do this i have got to do that because i am i have taken up a task and the fourth i must have enough money to afford a car now if all these four conditions are met then taking my car and driving it myself is a lot of fun use it in the context of equity investing and direct equity investing is akin to taking my car from bombay to delhi on a regular basis and remember it's not investing is not a one time journey we do it one every once every month at least because we save on a monthly basis and that's why i use that example now if i have to do that then first of all i need to know now this need to know how to invest and it's not as easy as getting onto an uh, you know uh, i mean that the, the, there are a few ads which uh, tend to be a little irresponsible i don't want to get into that but uh, simply being able to transact fast is not equivalent of making money in the uh, in uh, equity world the two are very very different things it's like boarding a train versus boarding a wrong train okay the boarding a train is very easy but first you need to know your journey plan so uh, that's uh, now do i know how to invest recently i got a request from somebody uh, and because i'm a trainer i got a request for training that a certain group of people uh you know last year they have started investing in equity now they want to understand how to invest in equity i said wonderful it's like a student appeared in the examination last year and now he is asking what is the syllabus and the, those kids are smarter they look at the syllabus before signing up for the exam right here we are write the paper and then worry about the syllabus so no what what are what you are getting into and what you are getting into means please understand the potential downsides investment business is a risk management business if you manage the risk well the asset class will deliver the returns but if you don't understand the risk you will lose your capital and more okay so that's one number 2 uh do you enjoy that task and the paperwork filing the tax returns and stuff like that number 3 you need to devote time do you read the balance sheets of companies before buying a stock well a lot of people don't they only look at the price and volume charts which is not enough for investing and the fourth one mutual funds charge certain amount as total expense ratio by not taking the help of those professionals i am saving that 2 to 2 and a half percent per year is my portfolio size large enough that saving that 2 to 2 and a half percent is worth the amount of time that I'm, that i'm spending on investing most often the answer is a big n o just imagine a portfolio of 1 crore where i am spending 2% per year uh, in to i mean uh, the total expense ratio 2% per year which is 2 lakh rupees in a year in order to accumulate an investment portfolio of 1 crore how much do i need to spend and what would be my annual salary to accumulate that portfolio of 1 crore i would rather be better off uh, working in my job or profession or whatever it is and leaving the stuff to an expert my sense is for a vast majority of people mutual fund is far superior as compared to directly investing in stocks there will be a minority who are excellent at managing their stocks and who qualify for those four i mean who satisfy those four conditions but a vast majority would be better off with mutual fund 
And the final point on that is know yourself. A lot of people, when I ask this question, do you know how to invest? And they would simply get up and say, yes, I know. But you ask three more questions, dig deeper, and the truth comes out. The truth generally loves to stay below. You need to find it out. But knowing myself is a tough job. It requires immense amount of courage to be critical about myself. But if I know the truth, I'll be better off taking the right decision. Those were very interesting analogies, uh, Mr. Trivedi. And uh, it's definitely, like you said, it's very important to know what you're getting into. So, uh, Mr. Sadagopan, uh, given the importance of uh, knowing what you're getting into, especially mutual funds are, uh, you know, a lot of times they're used for long-term uh, wealth creation. So, which category of schemes do you think are good for long-term wealth creation when it comes to mutual funds? So, it was a fantastic analogy of Amit. Uh, I mean, I, I loved them, absolutely loved them. See, uh, equity is not really for everybody. And this is exactly what we tell uh, our people. We ourselves, I mean, we are professionals. We don't get into equity. We use uh, mutual funds. The analogy which I give to my clients is that, see, uh, you want to create a financial edifice. Okay. I am that person. I am the financial architect who is going to create the financial edifice. There are lots of professionals out there who will make the windows, who will make the bricks, who will make whatever else I want to create that financial edifice. So why should I reinvent the wheel? It's all available. Mutual fund is one of those, uh, uh, you can say, products which is available, the brick which is available to construct my financial edifice. And the financial edifice which we are creating for our client is going to be different. But the products are all available out there. So there are professionals out there, hundreds of them are out there, who are managing that quite well. And uh, like Amit was saying, at uh, maybe one and a half, two percent, they are uh, doing that job. Now, one and a half percent or two percent may look like a lot. But actually, I mean, uh, the question to ask is, do we first and foremost have the time? I mean, in our very, very busy lives, do we have the time to uh, look at uh, uh, look at the newspaper, read all that, do actual research, look at the balance sheet? I mean, the fact is that none of us have time. And most of us run away from finance. We don't have the aptitude to even look at uh, look at anything that is required for uh, a proper investing. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, we are really talking about serious money. Do we want to experiment with our uh, money and uh, hope and pray that uh, everything will fall in place and we will meet the goals? When the market is fine, everybody uh, everybody will do well. But uh, I mean, we don't know what is going to happen, say, six months down the line, one year down the line. So I'll again come back to what Mr. Rao said, what my friend Amit has said, that mutual fund is certainly one of the best ways for investment for most retail investors. And I, when I say most retail investors, I'll say about 99% of the retail investors, this is the best way. Probably 1% may be like what Amit was saying. They, they may have the time, they may have the energy, they may have the aptitude, and they may have uh, that, that zing for doing that research. So that is only 1%. One, uh, 1%. For all the rest of them, it is mutual funds. Now coming to the question that you're asking me, See, uh, mutual fund, unfortunately, is understood as something that, okay, I have invested in Aditya Birla mutual fund, or I have invested in, let us say, HDFC mutual fund. This is how people, many people talk. But mutual fund itself is not just equity, and most people uh, tend to think that mutual fund means equity mutual fund, which is not really true at all, because you have, in fact, the entire range of financial, I mean, the entire range of assets are kind of represented in the uh, mutual fund universe. You have equity mutual fund, you have hybrid mutual fund, you have debt-oriented mutual fund, you have equity mutual fund, you have real estate-oriented mutual fund. So the entire range of assets, even you have uh, mutual funds which represent commodity or commodity-making companies. So, I mean, the entire spectrum is uh, represented by mutual funds. So now, what will you choose in your portfolio for wealth creation is actually a difficult question to answer because we are really talking about the entire spectrum. So what I would broadly say is that I mean, in terms of choosing uh, mutual fund, is that uh, the first thing is, uh, like Mr. Rao had said, regarding emergency fund, I will just go a bit deeper into that. See, as far as emergency funds are concerned, we are going to choose something where investment returns is not the thing. Liquidity is required and volatility should not be there. So we are looking at those kind of investments. So for those kind of investments, it can possibly be an arbitrage fund. It can possibly even be a short-term debt fund because see, emergency, you don't know. It can uh, come, let us say, four days down the line. It can come four years down the line, it, or it may never come at all. 
So you don't know. So you can have a mix of short term instruments, medium term, or even long term instrument. If the uh, emergency corpus that you are tending to create is actually large, it can be a mix of all these uh, all these kinds of things. To optimize the overall return, even in an emergency fund, the objective is I again reiterate is not to uh, make a high returns in an emergency fund. So that is the first uh, thing that we need to do: emergency and liquidity. Liquidity is something that uh, I mean we don't know. I mean in the COVID uh, times we have been tested, and a lot of people uh, did not have uh, appropriate emergency and liquidity provision. Liquidity provision typically should be about at least three months of one's expenses. So that is something that we have to keep it in again the short term uh, funds only, uh, maybe a liquid fund, money market fund, a low duration fund. Those kind of funds we can actually uh, look at. So that is the basic bedrock. Okay, now coming to uh, in, uh, investment. Now, what kind of assets do we need to have in the portfolio? That is contingent upon when the goals are coming. So suppose you are going to have goals coming up in the next uh, say uh, up to three years, you have to have those uh, money. In debt-oriented investments, probably you have invested in equity uh, in the past, but that has to be moved into debt because equity market is extremely volatile. So currently the market has started sliding. We don't know where it is going to go. So the point is now we have to move it into debt and we have to keep it in debt for the next uh, three years. Any goal which is required for three years. Now that can be arbitrary, that can be short term, that can be uh, money market low duration. So it has to be. Uh, we have to figure out. There is nothing like this is the right thing for you, and we have to figure out in the context of. Uh, uh, the fund house diversification, fund manager diversification, subcategory diversification. I mean, it, there are there are a whole lot of things. And then coming to uh, uh, equity oriented investment, there are, there are again a whole uh, bunch of uh, mutual funds subcategories which are available. Starting from the market capitalization oriented categories like large cap, mid cap, flexi cap, small cap, and things like that. Uh, you have to choose appropriate categories. And now we have active also, and we have passive also. Like in the case of Large cap category also we have active actively managed funds which are doing well and there are passively managed funds which have certain uh, certain things going for them like for example the charges are lower and the fund manager risk is taken out of the equation so now we have to see for which client we want to give which kind of fund even within within large cap and how much diversification we want to do in that particular category large cap also I can have maybe two funds or three funds I mean it all depends on the portfolio size. Okay, so um, I would just broadly, very broadly say that if a, if a person has the appropriate risk appetite, risk taking ability, uh, then that person can potentially look at mid cap and small cap or probably flexi cap. Flexi cap is far more safe uh, in that sense because the fund manager is going to decide based on the market uh, dynamics uh, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of composition should be there in the underlying portfolio. So flexi cap is a great product to have for many people. Whereas small cap and mid cap, if you have a, a high level of a high higher risk appetite, and if you have time on your side, maybe at least ten years or more, then and the goals are also, uh, I mean, accordingly uh, placed. I mean, you have uh, let us say a goal coming up after eight years, ten years, then probably a mid cap or a small cap fund may be more suitable. Now the other funds are sectoral funds. Other funds are thematic funds. Again, I mean, I have. Uh, I mean, I cannot really uh, give a pat answer to that because, see, uh, somebody is bullish on, let us say, a pharma sector, for example. Uh, instead of buying a, say, uh, Sun Pharma, for example, they can buy a pharma fund. But again, that has to be a very uh, well thought out, uh, clear cut, uh, I mean, uh, nuanced decision. Okay. And for all these things, I mean, either you need to know how to do that, how to actually put together a portfolio. A portfolio is not only about mutual funds. I have been talking only about mutual funds. Mutual funds are a very big part of the portfolio, certainly. But you also have a PP, a PPF, a employee provident fund, small savings scheme, Sukanya Samriddhi for people who are in the in that uh, phase of life, senior citizen savings scheme. Then you have bonds, you have NCD. There are so many products which are available. So now what is that you should put into that uh, uh, portfolio is something that we need to properly think. It's like cooking. So what should go into making, let us say, Kichdi is different from what should go into making, uh, let us say, Bisibala Huli. Okay, so it, it's different. So uh, that that a person has to know. If the person does not know, they should approach somebody who knows the subject. And uh, that is what I would say. I mean, I do I do not want to give a pat answer to this uh, question, but it's very very important for them to understand that the portfolio has to be properly well constructed, and it is not about equity alone or debt alone. Or gold alone, or it is not about chasing the one 
that is actually giving amazing returns at this point in time returns will come you have to be in the portfolio uh, that particular assets has have to be in the portfolio for you to enjoy the uh, upside you cannot really start buying the portfolio uh, buying that particular asset whether it is gold or whether it is crypto or whether it is anything else after uh, the horse is already bolted from the stable you cannot do that and you have to have the horse in the stable to start with so that is what i would want to broadly say that i mean it has it's a very uh, it's a job which has to be done very very carefully how much of equity how much of debt has to be carefully thought about mutual fund plays a very important role which categories i have already uh, talked about gold is also last thing which i want to say gold is also another uh, asset which people should have in their portfolio i would uh, suggest anything between 5 to 10% uh, in the portfolio but one thing i want to say as far as gold is concerned gold is a strategic asset class it is uncorrelated to for the large part with currency with uh, equity and uh, even with the economy when the economy does badly gold does well typically okay uh, so the point is now if a person is going into gold they should be willing to hold on to gold investments in whatever form whether it is sovereign gold bond whether it is a gold etf or any other thing they should be willing to hold on to it for years together like decades together like in the case of a property so assuming that they are willing to do that whether it gives 3% return or a 12% return gold is a fantastic investment to have in the portfolio it's a good stabilizer in the portfolio there are a lot of research papers which to show that a certain amount of gold in the portfolio is a good stabilizer in the portfolio so we have to look at all the asset classes together probably through the medium of mutual fund because it is very very liquid probably through the medium of mutual fund to construct a uh, appropriate portfolio for an investor absolutely uh, mr sadar gopan you have rightly pointed out the importance of asset allocation and uh, the good part of course is that this asset allocation can also be followed up through mutual funds so but all mutual funds may not give the best results even if you you know reach the right category so to say so mr rao what are the things uh, that one should consider when choosing a mutual fund this is the path uh, and it's a road you are going to travel if you are financial goals I mean, it is a very short term. I mean, if I have to take my uh, travel from my home, my house to the vegetable market, I mean, you, I can't use the wrong vehicle. I mean, what vehicle I use is either I use my two wheeler or my bicycle, or I walk down, or from uh, my place to my office it could be a ten kilometers. Again, I can use either a local transport or I can use my car. But if I have to travel to Mumbai and Delhi, and uh, I use my uh, like you know, I, I'll take my flight booking and I come there. is the investment vehicle which i choose depending on the time horizon is undergoing change and that's where uh, whether investment vehicle you choose right vehicle as earlier suresh ji said for my short term i need to be as safest as possible can i put it into it? and it's a medium term it could be a 3 years period of time or i can look i mean uh, he mentioned about the debt funds which is less volatile and where it i can liquidate it in a period of time for the long term i can choose those equity funds which can be with me that's that's one part of it and second part uh, when suresh ji said about uh, gold funds this is a strategic allocations which one you need to use to safeguard i think today being a dan terras probably if you are instead of buying a gold can you buy a gold fund that is the most effective way uh, where you can choose that that's that's the easiest option you can get. all that you need to do is investment horizon choose the fund okay thank you mr rao um so uh, coming to mr trivedi though we have uh, spoken about it uh, again and again that you know but we have discussed equity investments but uh, mr sadagopan also you know highlighted the importance of asset allocation and uh, investing in different uh, you know the, so to say products and not just stick with equity uh, uh, what are your views on that should one just uh, think of equity for wealth creation and or uh, asset allocation is the right way to go ahead a question that keeps coming again and again and uh, a lot of times uh, people look at the uh, return potential of an asset class to determine whether uh, this particular asset is suitable for wealth creation or not and a lot of uh, times you seen the discussions where uh, there are votes in favor of gold there are votes in favor of real estate or votes in favor of equity uh, very very often Uh, the voting keeps changing but the fundamental nature of various asset categories have to be seen and within that uh, equity has the potential to deliver inflation beating returns 
while at the same time being risky in the short term. And by risky, I mean the prices fluctuate wildly and often uh, in, a, in a manner that is difficult to explain for anybody uh, without the benefit of hindsight. I mean, I can I always do a post-mortem, but the diagnosis of volatility is impossible, that, the, whether the price will go up or not. Now, if that's the case, what do you do? And this is where uh, asset allocation plays a key role. Both uh, uh, Suresh and Rao, sir, did uh, highlight how to uh, take care of that asset allocation equation. But I'll uh, go back to the travel analogy. Incidentally, I've been using the travel analogy today uh, a lot. So I'll continue with that. And uh, borrowing from what uh, Rao, sir, was mentioning. See, in my house, if I have to go from my living room to the dining room, I don't need a vehicle. I can si simply walk. That's like when I've got a uh, goal, which is one week from now, I can keep the cash in hand. I don't need to worry about investing. I don't need a vehicle. But if I have to go from my place to uh, the you know, uh, neighbor who lives uh, five blocks away, then I can either walk or I can take my bicycle or I can even take a two wheeler and then my bike uh, and, and it, it, it takes. So I, my choice of vehicles goes up. But if I were to travel from my residence in Mumbai to a friend who lives in Gurgaon, now look at the combination of vehicles that I need to use. From my house, I walk up to the lift elevator. And then, then I take the lift and go down. Then from there, I walk up to the car. I get into a car or a taxi which takes me to the airport. Then again, I walk. At the airport, I board a plane. Then again, I uh, uh, reach Delhi, get down, get into a vehicle. So it's a uh, you know, combination of vehicles that I use. And most often, when the journey is short, like walking from living room to the dining uh, room, then one simple vehicle could be enough for my asset allocation. But when the journey is long, I need multiple vehicles. And this is where you take liquid funds or equivalent, which is bank deposits, or you take debt funds or equivalent, which are bonds and fixed deposits and long, I mean, long term fixed deposits or debentures, or you take hybrid funds, as Suresh was mentioning, which is a combination of equity and debt. From there, you go to equity, which is meant for long term. And within equity, then a lot of subcategories that Suresh highlighted beautifully well. You take all these things together and craft it in a nice portfolio, which helps you reach your destination. So again, going back to the discussion we started with, it has to be the goal, which has to be the starting point in the process. You define the goal where you want to reach and then work out the entire asset allocation. Now, within that asset allocation, if I were to travel from Mumbai to Delhi, train is, uh, sorry, flight is not the only vehicle, a train is also available, or I can travel by road also. And that's where my risk profile comes in. You know, the, the uh, 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 superstar comedian of yesteryear's Mahmood, he was afraid of flying. So he would mostly take a train, right? That was his risk appetite and choice of vehicle. Now, that's where your risk appetite also comes in together and you decide. But all of us know the moment I take a train in comparison to a flight, my Mumbai to journey, Delhi journey would become longer in terms of time. And that mental preparedness is equally important. Asset allocation is nothing but a process of allocating your investments across various asset categories or across various, I mean, an equivalent of a vehicle, across various asset categories, so that your journey to your financial destination becomes smoother, comfortable, and more predictive. That's how asset allocation has to be seen. That. So, but uh, that brings to me uh, brings me to a question, Mr. Sadagopan. We spoke about inflation, and there is a low interest rate scenario in the country right now. So, in this scenario, what are the instruments that can uh, really help while keeping the asset allocation in mind? Because there are certain your FTS have are not giving inflation beating returns anymore. So, 
uh, in this kind of scenario, what is the path to uh, wealth creation, so to say? And what are the key things that we should keep in mind uh, during the process of wealth creation overall? So let me uh, start with this thing called wealth creation to start with. Okay. So as far as wealth creation is concerned, a uh, lot of people tend to associate wealth creation with I mean, building massive amount of wealth. So that is how uh, it has been defined. Right in the beginning, Mr. Rao talked about not just financial wealth creation, but he talked about different dimensions of wealth. But I am going to focus only on the financial uh, dimension. Other dimensions are equally important in my opinion, but I am going to talk about mm -hmm. only the wealth creation. Uh, in the uh, from the financial part. but even this is not properly understood see for the first question that we have to answer is what is wealth creation why are we trying to create wealth and how much wealth do we want to create and to what purpose so these are very fundamental questions that we will have to answer so a lot of people say that i want to uh, build uh, say five crores at my retirement my question is i mean five crores is it enough i mean in the context of how you are living in the context of your goals is it enough and somebody may say, I want to have only two crores. Now, is that enough? So the point is, a lot of people have a general number in their head because they feel that that is the number to aim for. I mean, there is no one number which will work for any everybody, right? I mean, for somebody, even a one crore may work or even a 50 lakh may work because that person may be getting a pension for life. So for that kind of a person, uh, even if he has only 10 lakhs in hand, probably his life will be taken care of. And especially if this is a, a person who has worked in the government, even their medicals are taken care of. So even if they don't have any so-called wealth, uh, their life will still work. And for another person who does not have this fallback mechanism, the amount of wealth that they require is much, much more. So, so we have to understand the context. And then we have to understand the context of what are the goals, when the goals are to come. Like children's education may be a very general goal. But children's education means what? I mean, are you going to send the son or daughter for uh, a course in India or are you planning to send the son or daughter to a course abroad? So these have two different connotations of how much uh, you have to plan from the goal point of view. So wealth creation and what is the objective of wealth creation? And in that context, how much return are we seeking to get? So a lot of people, even who have say 10 crores, 15 crores, 20 crores, I have uh, clients like that. They say that I want to maximize my wealth because all my goals are anyway met. I beg to defer that. The point is now, what is the objective of making that 15 crore into 25 crore or 25 crore into 50 crore? So what's the objective? You are going to leave a higher corpus as far as your children are concerned. Your children probably are already doing well. I mean, knowing that you are the parent, probably they are also doing equally well. So what is the, what is the basic idea of leaving, let us say, 50 crores when they are probably 50 or 55 or something like that. What are they going to do? They already have wealth. So we have to understand what is this wealth? What are we going to do with the wealth? At what point we are going to distribute wealth? I'll go back to what Mr. Rao said. It is a philanthropy. I mean, a lot of, uh, lot of us Indians, we are not really thinking about giving back to the society. Like, like we are talking a lot about giving back to the society, but it is not happening in any very serious or significant way. So that is also something that we have to think when we are talking about wealth creation, we will have to think about giving back to the society. I mean, this society has given us everything. Whatever we are, we may, we may, uh, I mean, you can say, uh, you can say we may think that we have done everything, we have achieved everything, but the society and the ecosystem has helped us. We have to understand that particular thing. So in that context, what is the meaning of wealth? So if we look at all that, the wealth creation process itself is contextual. Okay, so now we have to look at what instruments we want to choose. So now, depending on the goals, depending on the asset allocation that we have chosen, uh, it has to be a proper, appropriate mix of equity-related vehicles, like uh, Amit had also given an analogy. Uh, the longer the duration, the more, uh, more different kinds of instruments may be required to achieve that wealth. And I also talked about the longer the duration, maybe you will invest in a particular uh, category of uh, asset. And then closer to that goal, you may want to switch into say something safe, something risk free, and you may want to uh, uh, you may want to meet that particular goal. So now, actually speaking, it cannot be only equity or it cannot be only property. I mean, these are uh, these are assets which can potentially give uh, very high returns. And in the context of today's scenario, uh, where the inflation is high and uh, the fixed income instruments are giving low, it may look like properties or equity and equity is doing well. So in that context, it may look like property or equity are the right instruments. 
but asset allocation can never ever be ignored because these two asset classes are typically very volatile and we have to come to the appropriate level of equity and debt and the current uh, situation is an aberration it will not ever be like this all the time if you look at the uh, history in india you would always see that uh, there is a positive uh, real return even in the case of fixed income so currently it may not be the case but we will come back to that uh, that scenario maybe a few months or a few years down the line so is there uh, is there a merit in considering fixed income instrument the, there is definitely a merit in considering a fixed income instrument uh, do we have to worry about the situation where probably there is no uh, real return yes we can worry about that a bit but i think we should not change uh, the asset allocation uh, by much because this situation over a period of time will also reverse so the point is i will just say focus on your goals focus on what you are creating wealth for focus on uh, uh, i mean uh, focus on uh, discipline focus on regularity of investment and uh, then i mean i would again say focus on the philanthropic uh, the giving back uh, aspect so that's also i i wouldn't really worry too much about the low interest rate scenario at this point in time i would largely ask my clients to continue uh, in the investments uh, where they are as per their uh, risk capital right mr sadagopan so this was really a vibrant discussion with all of you coming up with various interesting analogies and examples and i'm sure it was really informative for our viewers but before we conclude i would request all of you to share any wealth management lessons that you have on the occasion of diwali we can start with mr rao thank you so much nidhi and first of all thanks so much for a wonderful session wonderful interaction probably i can say the biggest lesson is uh, i'll start with uh, rather than my lessons the lessons i learned from suresh and amit trivedi both of them uh, suresh got uh, he has written one wonderful book called if god is your financial planner i know this diwali take this as an occasion i mean you know make sure you hands on it and read it uh, because it's the prosperity consciousness all that we need to bring and how you can make it uh, that's a uh, you learn lot of lessons not one lesson and amit has written many books but one of those books which i write uh, which i love the most is uh, lessons uh, from um, uh, 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 it's uh, icu and we should never enter into the icu i mean learn from somebody who has already gone into the icu and uh, then you you can know how you can prevent that these are the two lessons uh, i feel more important than the lessons which i got it and uh, i i always say uh, like you know uh, uh, sip is the way of life that is uh, save wisely uh, invest rightly and plan smartly then you are always there in the prosperity happy diwali to everyone and uh, may goddess lakshmi bless this diwali and many more diwalis to come and uh, during diwali pre diwali we clean up our portfolios i mean our houses and probably this time we need to clean up our portfolios to make that uh, lightening up of our portfolio which can give all the light as we go forward there is no darkness and we fail uh, we fall prey to that and uh, and also a diwali is an occasion you know you distribute sweets and you that's a cheering up yourself and bring the cheer in others is as well as reshji said is the philanthropy and uh, in fact i uh, sorry i took little longer time but i say another way of sip in, in the life is uh, Uh, you need to save for the savings that is your liquid fund you need to save invest that is i for your financial goals the p is invest for philanthropy even that part of the money can go for contribution regularly thank you so much that is a great take away mr rao uh, coming to mr trivedi uh, thanks nithi for this wonderfully engaging uh, discussion and uh, uh, a good anchor plays a major role in uh, making the uh, discussion so uh, enlightening so on this occasion of uh, diwali let me just uh, draw some of the lessons from the festival of diwali itself uh, you know what we do in uh, the, uh, during these day, days of diwali uh, can we do it in our personal finances so first of all what we do is we do cleaning up of the house we uh, declutter the home uh, look at your portfolio and declutter your portfolio make it simpler to manage uh, if there, there are too many things cut down uh bring it to a manageable level so declutter your portfolio is lesson number one lesson number two is it's a festival of lights we light the hours uh mr rao talked about reading certain books uh you know or reading outlook money for uh, example so uh, increase your knowledge uh, learn the subject of money management enlighten yourselves the third is we do lakshmi pujan 
Now, this Lakshmi Pujan is nothing but celebrating wealth. We have been uh, blessed with whatever wealth we have got. Uh, be grateful to uh, God and the society for that and celebrate that wealth that you got. There's uh, no wealth is uh, meaningful if we are not uh, happy and uh, we don't feel uh, grateful about it. So celebrate that wealth. And the last uh, is uh, again, repeating what both uh, the Suresh and Rao sir mentioned. Uh, we distribute a lot of uh, uh, gifts, we distribute sweets, distribute your wealth, donate money, do some philanthropy charity. So these are the four lessons according to me uh, for Diwali. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trivedi. And as Mr. Trivedi rightly said, that you know it's important to read books and uh, writ especially written by Mr. Trivedi. The, some of them are very, very informative and interestingly written, just like his analogies during uh, our chat. And you know, of course, pick up Outlook money too. And in fact, we have a story going on decluttering your finances on the occasion of Diwali in the next issue. So uh, with that, coming to Mr. Sada Gopan, what are your lessons for our viewers? So thank you, Nidhi, for uh, this wonderful session and for inviting me. Thank you, Aditya Birla, for uh, Mr. Rao, for inviting me to this session. Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from this session. So I'm sure uh, the people who are in the audience, they will also learn a lot uh, from this. I mean, it's a very simple session, but I think there are very uh, wonderful takeaways. Uh, both uh, my friend Amit uh, and uh, Mr. Rao, they have come up with amazing analogies. I'm going to take... Uh, with their permission, I'm going to take some of the analogies and use it with my clients. Uh, so, I mean, very wonderful, wonderful stuff. Very simply put, but I mean, it directly connects with what we need to do as far as wealth creation, money, uh, risk management. So, those kind of uh, things. So, uh, wonderful. Uh, so, I mean, they have covered uh, the entire thing, what we need to do as far as uh, Deepavali is concerned. I mean, uh, in the context of uh, Deepavali, I would wish all the, the entire audience are very auspicious, and wonderful Deepavali and a very, very healthy and prosperous times ahead. So the two things are, uh, we keep wondering or we, we want to control the things which are not controllable. So this is, this is the typical human psyche. So that is exactly the thing which we need to discard during this Diwali. Okay, so uh, what is not controllable, the stock market is not controllable. Okay. Uh, expenses, the inflation is not really controllable. I mean, you you can make changes in your expenses, but the inflation itself is not really controllable. Your expenses are controllable. So the point is, we have to distinguish between what we can control and not worry about what we cannot control. The economy is not controllable. Whether there will be uh, some war in uh, some place or whether the commodity price will spike because of that, it's not controllable. So we have to make a clear distinction between what is controllable, what is not controllable. And in the context, I will say there are just two things that we have to look at in financial planning. Only two things. One is expenses and one is gold. That's it. Don't worry about the income. We have seen so many clients who are earning very modest sums uh, just because they have been able to control the expenses and keep the goals in accordance with what they are earning. They are financially secure. And we are we are also having clients who are earning lakhs of rupees per month and they are nowhere near being financially uh, secure. Well, their financial freedom is still a mirage for a lot of them. So this is one. So keep the portfolio very simple. I mean, uh, Amit was talking about a, a Diwali cleaning. Even Mr. Rao was mentioning about a Diwali cleaning. I think that is exactly what we need to do. We need, we don't have to have all the things that come into the market, every NFO, every IPO, and every uh, mutual fund and every other product which is coming in the market like PMS and AF. We don't have to have all those things in the market because the basic thing is, there are only four basic asset classes, broadly speaking. You have equity, you have uh, you have uh, commodity, you have uh, debt and you have property and maybe gold. Okay, commodity, uh, gold actually comes in the market. All the other things are derivatives of these things. Just have proper representations of these four asset classes in appropriate vehicles and leave it at that and have a long-term orientation towards the thing. You don't have to keep on uh, churning the portfolio. This is another fallacy with uh, people. So this is time to discard that fallacy. A portfolio or a wealth creation is done over a long period of time. We all have an action bias. Okay, If you see the uh, goalie, uh, any football match, uh, the chance of a penalty shootout going to the left-hand side or the right-hand side or in the middle is exactly the same. Whereas you will see that the goalie will either jump to the left or to the right. You will very seldom the goalie will stand in that place. 
though the probability is one third, one third, one third. Okay, so that is the action bias at work. And if he does not jump to the left or right, I mean, in spite of the fact that he has, uh, I mean, he has not been able to save the goal, the audience will think that he has not done his job if he has been able to, if he has just stood in the middle and the goal has not been saved. But if you have jumped to the left and the goal came right in the center, it's it he's excused. That is the action bias at work. So that's a problem. I mean, we have to understand that not doing anything is an action by itself. And we have to have tremendous amount of discipline to not do anything. And in the context of portfolios, not doing anything is actually a very positive decision. So those are the two, three things uh, that I wanted to say. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sadagopan. Like Mr. Sadagopan said, that expenses and goals is what one should focus on and financial discipline is something uh, very, very important for uh, all investors and uh, all retail investors, especially. So thank you all for such a great session. And on that note, wish you all a very happy Diwali. Have a good day. Thank you so much. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.